Okay, in, in collaboration, is there any expectation of confidentiality? Well, every deal is different, and it depends on uh, whether you're collaborating to write a true crime book, which is an anthology, and I, I, I did three of those, uh, in which there isn't any expectation of privacy because you're not, you're not reporting or writing the story of your partner. Uh, but generally speaking, every, every biography that I have done in, as a collaboration our agreement has specified that the information provided uh, for the book belongs to the person who provided it, until the book is published, of course. What, what you really have to anticipate is the fact that you may not finish the book, one party may pull out. So if that's the case, yes, anything, uh, and in fact I, had, I have had a couple of projects like that, anything that is told to you for use in this book if it's not used in the book, or if the book is never published, yes, there is an expectation of privacy. I was thinking more, though, is, is there an expectation or is there an agreement that you not reveal that you're the ghostwriter, or is that always known, and is your name on the book? And in ghostwriting, uh, and this is a general ghostwriting question, yes. really. Uh, the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. Uh, the question was uh, whether it is revealed that you are the ghostwriter, uh, am I paraphrasing you correctly, uh, or is that kept confidential? In your case, how did that go? Well, I have five ghostwritten books. One was uh, about a very mundane subject, finding funding for grants in academia, uh, and I was completely anonymous in that. Uh, one was uh, a, a rather long and uh, interesting book about lookism, which is, uh, if you all know what racism is, lookism is the same thing, discrimination based on physical appearance. That's lookism. And that was a book that uh, I was given uh, a credit buried in, with about a hundred others, uh, you know, on, on page 11 of the acknowledgments. But as far as uh, the publisher is concerned, I had nothing to do with it. Uh, I was a, a true ghost. Then there were two novels that I, I ghost wrote from outlines by someone who had trouble with outlines. Uh, and I, I was completely a ghost in that, just completely invisible. So the answer is every, every circumstance is different. Uh, the guy that I wrote these two novels for, uh, that's what he had in him. He had two outlines. And uh, now what he does is he, he has a corduroy jacket with patches on the elbows and he goes to writer's conference and talks about his book. But I got the money. <laughs> so do you tend to get paid more if your name is on the book or if your name is off the book? Uh, I would I would think that you would get more. It's it's, it's really what the what the market will bear. Uh, I did not have to have my name on Leonard Goldenson's book, but he told me that he wanted it on there. I didn't have to have my game my name on uh, Russell Means book, but I demanded it. It's a whole other story, which maybe you'll ask me about. I will. <laughs> That's one of them. Yeah. Uh, in general, the, the, the difference is one is a ghost and the other is a collaborator. Uh, a collaborator uh, should expect to get less because you're going to get some credit. Right. And we do do uh, ghost writing panels from time, from time to time. So uh, now we are the Independent Writers of Southern California. Uh, independent writer that has the the term has kind of changed over the years as has the expectation of success. Um, how would you define a successful independent writer? How would I define a what? A successful independent writer. A successful independent writer who one that is, is one that uh, can pay the rent. Yes. <laughs> That's a successful writer. If you don't have to, ha well, even if you have to have a day job, 
uh, but you write because you want to or because you must uh, and for the satisfaction of it I would define that as successful uh, if you are locked up in your little garret and you can't pay the rent I wouldn't say that was successful okay so um, your writing career which is just getting underway after 50 years of actually doing it because um, there's another 50 coming Oh, yeah, um, you've written books. You've written magazine articles about uh, everything that I've ever heard of. Um, it says here from a missing alligator, which is one I have not heard um, from you anyway, to a guy who delivers ice, to illegal Japanese business practices, to solving the the, the murder of Thelma Todd. Um, so you don't seem to specialize, and why is that? I specialize in not specializing. Uh, I guess it's, it's, there's two reasons. Uh, half of it is I, I really am curious about almost everything. Uh, some things more than others, but I, I really am curious about things. Uh, I get wrapped up in reading and researching stuff that will never be a book, but I just find it interesting. And the second reason is, as I said, people keep coming to me. Uh, they approach me. Uh, I I got a, an email three days ago, and I don't know when I'm going to do this. My agent, at this point in my career, my agent has a veto. If he doesn't think he can sell it, I'm not going to waste my time. Uh, but I was approached uh, secondhand through a good friend of mine, a guy I've known 50 years, uh, who was probably the best known uh, author of the Vietnam War. Uh, Joe Galloway wrote a wonderful, wonderful book called We Were Soldiers Once and Young. Uh, and Joe is very busy now with the 50th anniversary celebration of the Vietnam War and uh, with writing his own memoirs when he's not playing poker online. This is, I got that from his wife. I, I, didn't, I didn't know it myself. Anyway, uh, he sent me a, an email from a guy that had approached him and this guy, uh, whose name I don't recall at the moment, but I have it written down, this has only been a couple of days, uh, is a, an appellate judge in Nevada. In Vietnam, he was the guy who replaced Lieutenant Cowley. He was the guy who took over Cowley's platoon after Cowley uh, rotated home. Remember, nothing happened to Cowley. No word of this, no disciplinary action until many months after uh, the My Lai massacre and so the story was he took over this platoon and somebody tried one of his one of his men tried to kill him that night I don't know why that's as much as I know about it uh, the fact that it was it was Cali Rusty Cali was his nickname uh, that interests me is that he, he took over his platoon if you think about it, it's a platoon of killers. Almost all of them participated in the massacre, even though Callie is the only one who was held to account and not very much of that either. So I might I might follow up on this, uh, but I have to let Doug Grad, my agent, tell me whether he thinks they can sell it. More than likely, he'll tell me, talk to the guy and come back to me with a few paragraphs. Okay, so you, you, you call yourself a recovering photographer. I don't just call myself, I am. Okay, you are, you am a recovering photographer. So how does that fit in to your writing life? Uh, not much anymore. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a recovering photographer because uh, there came a time when uh, I had to become a writer because I, I couldn't be a single dad and a photographer. I couldn't be a photographer who would get a phone call at 6 in the morning, that's 9 o'clock New York time, saying, can you be in Las Vegas by noon, your time? Uh, I couldn't do it. I had a 14-year-old uh, daughter, and she needed someone to be home to supervise her. So uh, fortunately, I had some writing skill. I actually, by that time, I'd actually written a book. But I still thought of myself as a photographer. I hadn't decided to become a writer. The book kind of found me. So 
for the next several years, I did some photography. But as time went on, uh, photography and photographers changed. Uh, when I became a photographer, you had to know quite a bit of technical stuff because uh, very few photographers had a light meter. And those who did have a light meter, it wasn't in the camera. And the camera didn't focus automatically. And you had choices about film. Remember film? Uh, and shutter speed and lens aperture and choice of lens. There's all these things you had to know about. And on top of that, you had to uh, be at a certain place at a certain time and bring back something that nobody else maybe was able, was able to be able to get. Uh, that's all changed now. Anybody with a cell phone can be a photographer. But at the time that we're speaking of, uh, in the late, the mid 80s actually, mid to late 80s, uh, magazines were beginning to disappear. The big magazine circulation was falling, TV was taking their advertising money, and so what they were paying for photographers was less. They would want you to go out and shoot five hours, and they'd pay, uh, plus two hours travel each way, and they'd pay you half, half a day's rate. And also, it was getting to be, uh, you needed more and more equipment. This is still the film era. Everything had to be lit. If you were to go out to take a portrait of a CEO, you used to be able to put him in front of a window with a uh, reflector and get away with it. Not, not by then. And photographers were getting less and less and working more and more. And it, it just looked like I was never going to be the world's greatest photographer. I, I was a journeyman photographer. Not, not a bad photographer, but not a great photographer. On the other hand, I was just beginning to feel my oats as a writer. So I had to make a choice. But I never entirely gave up photography. It's uh, whether I'm shooting for work or not, I'm shooting. And I, I, many of us have seen some of your work, and it's beautiful. Thank you. you have really great stuff. So, And if you haven't seen Marvin's work, you should. Is it online? Do you have stuff online? Some is, yes. Okay. I recommend it highly. Um, okay, so how do you handle failure? You must have experienced failure sometime in your life. I have experienced far more failure than success, please believe me. Uh, one, one of the things that uh, keeps me going is I know I can do the work. The, the question always is, can you find the work? And my low point was about uh, eight or nine years ago, ten years ago, something like that. Uh, I had about uh, $300 in the bank. I had a mortgage payment of $1,100 coming. I had cashed in my life insurance already. I had cashed in all of, all of my uh, stocks and bonds. Yes, I actually had stocks and bonds. Uh, I couldn't refinance my house because uh, I had no income at the moment. And on top of that, I had uh, torn my meniscus in my left knee, and I was flat on my back with excruciating pains in my left thigh. Uh, the doctor told me that it was a slip disc, but it wasn't. And I had days lying there saying, how am I going to pay the bills? What's going to happen here? And then one day I hobbled over to get the mail and there was a check for $43,000. And the next day there was a check for $8,000. Two different people. Uh, these were guys that I had been talking to, there's two of my ghostwriting jobs, I had been talking to off and on for years, literally years. Uh, one guy I talked to for seven years, this was the guy who had the book on lookism. And by the, day, the name of the book is Looks. Why do they matter? Uh, so that got me whole. That was my low point. But there, are, there have been times when I've had to go and consciously stare at the award plaques and say, you were once a pretty good writer. You could do this again. And the other thing about dealing with failure is uh, you have to just accept that it's part of the business. If you are a baseball player, you expect to not get on base seven times out of ten. If you're a very good baseball player. Uh, it's a tough business, but 
part of part of it is developing an attitude of self-confidence, knowing that somehow and you will you'll prevail if you don't quit, if you don't just lock yourself in your bedroom uh, and watch sitcoms. Nothing anything wrong with sitcoms. <laughs> Yeah, so fa failure, rejection, uh, that's true for any job, any part of life. But with writing, we take it a little more personally. I mean, because it's, it's, our, it's us that's coming out onto the page. So um, kudos to you for handling it. Uh, speaking of handling, how did your life in the service influence your writing? How much time do we have? <laughs> Uh, a, a lot, uh, in, in many different ways. Uh, let me divide this into three categories. My first three years and two months in the Army was entirely spent in the infantry. And what you learn in the infantry is you can walk or run or crawl a lot farther than you think you can when you have to. The other thing you learn in the, in the infantry is discipline. You learn to, if you're a squad leader, and for a, wh a while, uh, at about the middle of that three years, I was, uh, and you're out in the field at night, and you have a guard, and the guards are supposed to be on duty for two hours, and then you, next guy is supposed to take their place, you're supposed to, they're supposed to wake up their relief. If you don't check on them, they ain't gonna do it. They're gonna, they're gonna go to sleep on you. So you have to, come to rely on yourself and, and believe in yourself. You have to believe that uh, you are the equal or better of, of any man in your squad. Uh, and I have to tell you, quite frankly, that being as short as I am, that hasn't always been easy. But I learned it. You know, you're not judged by the size, the size of the man in, in the Army. You're judged on what you can do and how well you do it. It's a, it's a pure meritocracy. Uh, so that was that first first three years. The second part of, uh, of this was my year and three months in Vietnam. And I had the great fortune, good fortune, to number one, work for the best public information officer of his era, and maybe the best ever, a man by the name of Charles Seiler, who not only it was a professional in every sense, he had enormous integrity. I stood at attention next to him as he told the full colonel, the chief of staff of the 1st Cavalry Division, that he would not lie for the Army. He flat wouldn't do it, and if they didn't like it, they could set him down to an infantry battalion. You don't find that very often in men, and it was a great lesson to me. Uh, three years later, I had the same kind of job he had in his 7th Infantry Division. And I was asked to lie, and I had I gave the same response, expecting to go down to a, to an infantry company, but I wasn't sent. I told the guy what he needed to hear. So I had that great role model. Secondly, in Vietnam, again, this is the start of the the war, in '65 and '66, and we were uh, the feature attraction in those years. The first cavalry was. We were the first time that soldiers had flown into battle in something as complicated and thin-skinned as a helicopter, and the press wasn't quite sure what was going to happen, so they showed up to take pictures and ask questions. I met the queen of the International Press Corps. I worked with them. I escorted them, I asked them questions, I watched, I listened, I learned. You could not have had a better school. Just not possible. And even the guys in my section, the soldiers in my section, uh, were some very professional reporters. I learned the rudiments of news reporting from Joseph Treister, uh, who after he got out of the Army, he stayed in Vietnam and worked for the New York Times and spent 44 years at the New York Times. You don't spend that long at the New York Times unless you're a damn good reporter and you like living in New York. Uh, Finally, I had the, uh, and this really impacts on, on books, I had the great good fortune to escort John Steinbeck for a week in Vietnam and be the proverbial fly on the wall, watch him work. It was very instructive. 
uh, a, a more humble man you would never meet. You would never know he was a Nobel Prize winner. In fact, he instructed me not to tell anyone his last name because he didn't want to talk about himself. He wanted to listen to what they had to say. Uh, I also did the same thing for a man named S.L.A. Marshall, Simon, Samuel Lyman Atwood Marshall. Uh, if you're of a certain age, you will know that he was a very well-regarded uh, military writer going back to World War II. He was also a fraud and a liar, and I found that out, too. Uh, and I had the great pleasure of showing him up for a fraud and a liar, but that was, a, it was never a, something I set out to do. It just happened. So if you spend a year in the company of those kinds of people, men and women, uh, you get a great picture of what this business is about and who the people in. And, uh, I once had lunch with three Pulitzer Prize winners. Four, if you count the fact that one of them won the award twice. Uh, and they're just people, you know, they're guys. Uh, they have a certain attitude. They're gonna do what they're gonna do. Nothing's gonna stop them. That's a great thing to have. And finally, as you get up in rank in the Army, or any military service, people give you mission assignments. They don't tell you how to get a job done, they just tell you to get it done. And the first time this happened was uh, in Vietnam. I was a brand new sergeant. Well, I was a brand new sergeant for the second time. And we had a horrible, horrible slit trench on our little forward uh, base, in a, which was in a, well, believe it or not, in a cemetery. This is, this is landing zone dog. And uh, a man named Andre Hewitt was a prince of a man, a wonderful man, and an amazing photographer, uh, had to relieve himself using this slit trench. Just imagine a slit trench, eight inches wide and six or seven feet long. And uh, the problem was that Andre Hewitt's mother was Vietnamese and he had skin the color of tea. And the headquarters commandant sent his first sergeant out to tell Henri Hewitt that he couldn't poop in our slit trench. That it was only for U.S. forces. And my boss grabbed me and he said, take anybody you need, find any resources you need. I want to find a shit house in Vietnam and I want it by dark. So I did. I had never built a latrine before, anywhere. But I'd been in my share. <laughs> And I had some pretty good people working for me, and so we went and we did it. We scrounged the materials, and we did it. And when we got all done, and this is the best lesson there is, Major Siler said, it just needs a sign. And I said, well, what should the sign say? PIO personnel only? He said, no! The sign should say, this latrine is available to anyone. First guy to use it was the headquarters coming. So to become a successful writer, you build a latrine. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, uh, this this can be another kind of long but really interesting story. Handling personalities when you're writing a biography. I'm thinking Russell Means. You want me to tell you about Russell Means? Oh God. <laughs> uh, let's take another one of those little breaks. Five, five more minutes. You have five minutes? That's okay. Shut it down and we'll start it again. I'll just stand up for a minute.